Hi there, Mike Hall here coming at you from Chicago. Old National Bank is our presenting sponsor on Big Ten today. Glad to have you with us over the course of the next hour. We've got multiple interviews. We've got a ton of things to get to, but... As I mentioned in that tease, baseball is the first thing on our minds. We're underway in the Big Ten Baseball Tournament. The first games happened yesterday. The second two games will be played today. Again, it's a different schedule, so there's only two games being played today. One at 2 o'clock Central, one at 7 o'clock Central. It is our big story today, and for that you bring in a big guest as we look at the bracket for the Big Ten Baseball Tournament. The two games today, again, happening at 2 o'clock uh, Central time will be Nebraska and Rutgers, and then you've got Michigan and Illinois at 7 o'clock Central time. That'll be an elimination game. The guest I'm talking about is known not for his foul ball catches, but much more for his skill set <laughs> on the mic. Just ask his broadcast crew. It's Dana Hughes joining us now, calling the action all week long in Omaha. And Dana, yesterday, Iowa, Indiana, Maryland all won. Give us the biggest takeaway from the games yesterday. Man, I don't know if there was the biggest takeaway. It was all chalk, so the, the top seeds uh, won their first games yesterday, and I thought it was in fitting fashion. If you look at Iowa, which I think unbiasedly is probably the most complete team pitching, hitting, and defense, uh, they were able to come through and run spread uh, their opponent in that first game without having the best starting pitching from Marcus Morgan. Look at Maryland, who we know is the strongest team, the ranked team in this tournament, and they came through in solid fashion in a tight game. So I feel like the defense that was displayed, five double plays to quiet down the Spartans by the Terrapins, Iowa's offensive production, the Grand Slam, another home run, uh, shows that there is some true star power and power in this tournament so far it's going to be interesting to see today how things unfold with the hometown huskers coming to play because they can put the ball out of the park as well so i feel like leading up to this tournament mike it was a different year because we're normally talking about the bottom four teams who could possibly be in those final two or three slots while this year we were talking about six possible teams being a number one seed going into that wild card weekend. So it's definitely different. And I feel like that cluster at top is going to make it more interesting. Well, you brought up Iowa up at the top there in that grouping. And I want to start with them. You mentioned the Grand Slam. Braden Frazier is actually going to join us in just a little bit here on the show to talk about that four-run shot he hit. Um, but let me talk about the, the elephant in the room is the possible NCAA violations that have kept Keaton Anthony off the roster. Uh, from your point of view, and considering they scored 13 runs yesterday without him, how are they handling his absence? Well, not only have they handled it greatly in this tournament, but if you look at leading into the tournament, they won eight of their ten games without those five guys, including Keaton Anthony. So when you talk about a complete team, a deep team, a team that has rallied from adversity, there's nothing like losing the freshman of the year last year, an all-conference player this year, and still staying on that same road. So i got to give credit to Rick Heller and his staff because that's something that could have truly, truly kneecapped a lot of teams by losing that type of caliber player, and yet they're just continuing to steamroll. Hawks are the three seed this week. Your top seed is Maryland. I want to turn there next. So the back-to-back -back regular season champions, you mentioned they had five double plays turned by their defense in that game yesterday. They've got a good offense. They were in a bit of a pitching duel yesterday. In case there's someone who just hasn't followed a ton of baseball and they're just tuning in for this tournament, you look at your top seed Maryland and you think they do what better than anybody else? Pressure. They continue to pressure you offensively. Not the best pitching overall, but what they do one through nine, truly one through nine in the lineup has been phenomenal this year as well as last year. Let's consider they lost the player of the year in Bubba Aline last year. They lost another draft pick in Maxwell Costas at first base. They fill those holes with not just guys that are just there to be a part of the team, but guys that are leading in top three categories on the team. Power numbers are up. They just continue to impose their will offensively against opposing pitchers, and it makes it tough. When you look at Michigan State, I saw Coach Jake Boss Jr. in the hotel. It's like five double plays. We just could not put a ball in the air. And then give it up to Keister and Matt Shaw, the player of the year, 
mostly known for his offensive prowess, but came through with some gold glove type of performance yesterday. So Maryland, like it's one of those teams where they frustrate you because you feel like if you play them close, you have a chance. But yet with Nick LaRusso and his RBI ability, they just figure out ways to win, whether close games or blowouts. I mentioned Maryland's the top seed. You talked about how there's that cluster at the top of the top three seeds. And, and then you threw in a good point with Nebraska going to have some home field advantage with these games being played in um, Omaha. Overall, Dana, how many teams this week do you really think realistically have a shot to win it all? Man, I, I can tell you Indiana, they're young. It's kind of one of those deals where they, they're too young to know what they don't know yet. And they're going to come in here, and they're, they've shown that they can be a team and a force to be reckoned with, Nebraska as well. I feel like five or six teams. Let's not forget Rutgers. To me, that's one of the biggest stories coming into this tournament based on the travesty that happened last year with them being left out of the NCAA tournament. The fact that they won 45 games last year and they and got to the championship, didn't lose a game in the Big Ten tournament, got to the championship – Played on just a few hours rest because of all the rain delays. Lost that game, 45 wins, and did not get a nod. To me, that's kind of that chip on the shoulder team that I'm really rooting for in this tournament. So to answer your question, I'd say those six teams that could have been number one uh, into Wild Card Weekend, to me, each of them definitely could make some noise in this tournament. I would not be surprised to see any of them on Sunday. This is a tournament that historically has started today on Wednesday. This year, it was moved up to start on Tuesday because of what we happened last year. There were all, yeah, you're praying. Exactly. Uh, we had those crazy weather situations and games got delayed and pushed and think games were starting after midnight. Um, how has that format in general, I mean, you mentioned you've been talking with coaches in the hotel. You're in Omaha around the players and everyone. How has the new format generally been received? Everyone has loved it. I think the biggest question mark was you had wild card weekend last week and you played Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and then you had the quick turnover to playing on Tuesday. That was the biggest question. But I think once you got over that thought or that hurdle, everything else lines up well, considering the teams that won yesterday in Indiana and Iowa, they get a day off. So they get that rest that they would have needed before the tournament started. You also have Michigan State that will have the day off as well. So I feel like it all comes together. Speaking personally and biased, I did 15 games last year <laughs> and went to bed at like 4 in the morning a couple of nights only to get up at 7. So I am thankful to all the schedule makers for making the adjustment. But the coaches and players, I haven't heard a negative thing about it. I think it stretches it out well to play a 3-2-3, three, two, three, two, possible four, and then the one championship format. I think it works well for everybody. Let's also remember the aces that pitched yesterday could possibly come back on Sunday if either of those teams make it to the championship. So I think right. that's a factor that comes into play well. And the thing you're leaving off is, you know, you push for this change more than anyone for fear of being stuck <laughs> with Kevin Kugler all day long i mean it's just you know it's inhumane is what happened last year to you so yeah everybody's got to do charity mike you know and, <laughs> and i just chalk up part of this weekend as a charitable endeavor for the big 10 network and dealing with kevin the fact that he and scott pose they went off on me i did not miss the foul ball you guys have shown it i just didn't get close enough to it because i was being a company man and decided that I cared about the computer yep. and the monitor yep. and the mics and everything else more than those guys would. So you know how selfish those guys are versus me being the consummate teammate. Yep, it's true. They're bad people. You're good people. It's very simply put. We understand it. Uh, there's a track record that proves it. You know, the games are happening there at Schwab Field in Omaha. I have been to uh, that field a handful of times. I've actually never been in it, which I'm really bummed about. I want to be able to see a baseball game in there. Can you explain what it's like in there? I mean, it, it's got such great history, and, and when the College World yeah. Series is there, it's just flooded and there's energy around. What is it like in that park? Oh, it's electric. To me, it, it epitomizes college baseball. I'm a huge college baseball fan, having played at the University of Iowa. We did not make it to Omaha during my years, so... These have been great experiences for me. And I will tell you one of the 
most electrifying and most uh, crazy experiences that I had in baseball alone was when Kyle Schwarber and the Indiana Hoosiers, I believe it was back in 2013 or 14, played against the Nebraska Cornhuskers. And this place was standing room only, 19,000 plus people. And you see the star power, uh, the, the energy and the excitement in the stands. It, I mean, it was the greatest thing I had seen in college baseball in all my years. And now the Huskers are coming up and playing today. We'll see if they can make a run for it. The fans around here in Omaha and Lincoln rally for this team, as we know, just about in every sport. So it can be an electric uh, environment. The Hawkeyes, if they are uh, up against the, the Cornhuskers at some point, you'll see fans coming across the bridge from Council Bluffs and being a part of this as well. So the fact that it just in a couple more weeks after this tournament, we'll see the College World Series here. This is just kind of the appetizer, and it's a big appetizer. It's special, and it's been really fun. Before I let you go, uh, again, to recap today's games, you got four versus five, Nebraska and Rutgers. That's the first game for both of those teams. Then you got Michigan and Illinois, two teams that lost yesterday, so this is an elimination game. In those two matchups today, give me a storyline to follow, a player to watch, a trend to keep an eye on, something that should have us glued to the TV. So I'll start with the Nebraska Rutgers game. For me, Nebraska is how do they handle this environment when knowing that they are basically the home team in this tournament? They have had huge numbers, power numbers from Max Anderson and Bryce Matthews. Are those guys going to show up? So far in this tournament, we've seen the stars show up. So are those guys going to show up and is that trend going to continue? Then with Rutgers. The chip on their shoulder based on the atrocity that they experienced last year without getting the nod. What is that going to do to propel that team in this tournament, knowing that each of those teams has to pretty much win out to feel comfortable getting into the tournament because Rutgers experienced last year just getting to the championship. When you think about Michigan and Illinois, they're fighting for their season's lives. To see the seniors, uh, the draft-eligible kids, see if they're going to step up and play their last games the best way they can. I talked with Dan Hartlib before their game yesterday. He said, we should be the most relaxed. We know that we have to win all the way through in order for us to extend our season. I feel like that's the same with Michigan. Let's also remember, Michigan has been down this road before, and they've rallied not just to get through the Big Ten tournament. They won it last year. Prior to that, they got just enough wins in this tournament to get one of the final four seeds into the NCAA. What did they do? They wind up going all the way to the championship, winning the first game against a very, very good Vanderbilt team. To me, that's a team that can be scary because of their history of playing in the postseason. First game is at 3 Eastern, 2 Central time. Second game at 8 Eastern, 7 Central time. Dana Hughes will be on the call. Always great chatting with you, man. Have fun this week. All right, brother. Thank you. Special group, special weekend, so says Northwestern softball account. Yeah, I think it's pretty special. The Cats are moving on in the NCAA tournament. They're going to be playing in the Super Regional Friday in Alabama against Alabama. And they're going to be doing so because Skylar Schellmeyer has been playing some excellent softball. In fact, specifically, she's a part of our big stat brought to you by Old National Bank. You look at Big Ten players with 50 hits or more and 20 stolen bases or more this year. She's right up there with them. 55 knocks and 20 swipes. We bring in Skylar Schellmeyer just before she leaves for Alabama. And uh, we got a lot of big picture stuff. But si since we're coming off that graphic, Skylar, how much do you love the feeling of stealing a base? Yeah, I mean, I think it's fun. Um, I just like, you know, like, I don't know, just like running and sprinting as fast as I can is is awesome. But I really don't think much of it. Like, Kate sends me and I do it, you know? <laughs> so is it is it 100% I'm not going unless Kate sends you? Or do you have the license to be like, I don't know, I got a lead. They're not looking. I'm out. Um, I would say it's mostly up to Kate. There's been times where, like, if we had the change up picked... Like, maybe I'll go, but mostly up to Kate. All right. I follow her lead. <laughs> That's a wise choice. That generally leads to success. Uh, speaking of success, you guys were the Big Ten Tournament champions. I want to go back to the championship match. It's one versus two in the league, you and Indiana. Maeve Nelson walks it off for the title. Where does that rank among the great 
team memories you've had in your time in Evanston? You know, I think it it definitely ranks like top two, maybe top three, just because like in my five years, we've never won the Big Ten tournament before. And, you know, coming from behind, especially in the seventh inning and walking it off, I think that's like a super special moment. And it's kind of like checking one of our goals off um, our list. And it was like super special and I think super special for the fifth years because we've been working for this for five years now. So it's, it was really fun. Yeah, dramatic way for you guys to finally get a tournament I know. title. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's the way to do it, right? Keep the, keep the heartbeat going with a walk-off by Maeve. Um, and during that Big Ten tournament, obviously it ended with you having plenty of reason to dance, but, you know, our cameras were on you, Skylar, throughout the tournament, and you were letting it loose. It was so clear how much fun you were having just being yourself all week long. It's, it's high stress, as you can see, to this point. <laughs> yes, watching that clip, it's, like, so funny to me because... I like don't even think about the cameras a lot of the time. Like I'm just out there with my friends. Like, my, I mean, my teammates will tell you like I love to dance, and um, I think it just brings the energy and kind of loosens things up for everybody around us. And you know, it's just a game at the end of the day, so just want to have fun with it. Well, that's good. And that was, by the way, only one clip. I mean, that happened a bunch. We had, you know. Our crew, Lisa Byington, ended an interview with you and basically just said, you have to dance for us now, which you don't, by the way. Lisa doesn't control oh, you, but, yeah. but you did it anyways. Yeah, you know, I can only really dance on the field. That's my rule right now. Um, <laughs> I got to save my energy. That's smart. But, yeah, I was being, like, so stiff during that post-game interview, and they were like, all right, you know, we'll let you go if you dance for us. And I was like, okay, fine. <laughs> so I just gave him a little taste, a little taste. <laughs> Well, because of that, you moved on to the NCAA tournament. You guys have been playing great ball so far. Just a few days ago, you guys were stuck in a bases loaded, nobody out jam in the bottom of the seventh, and you got out of mm -hmm. it to win the entire Evanston Regional. Take me back to that moment. What were you thinking? What were the stress levels like as so much drama was again riding on just a few batters? Yeah, I mean, something we talk about um, in like every inning in those moments is getting the first out. And we obviously didn't do that. And, um, but I felt like our composure, even though it didn't go our way, like we stayed really calm and like we, we had that like hope and like we knew like we were gonna win. Um, and what we have, I, I have so much trust in Danielle and like our defense and we've been playing a phenomenal defense this year and Danielle's been doing great and our pitching staff has been doing great. But I think the scariest moment for me was when they went to they uh, like replayed the play at home and I knew Jordan like would have a, at least a foot on the bag but it was just like scary because the replays haven't been going for us like the entire day and just I was literally sitting there like come on replay gods like do us <laughs> do us one here so um super fun moment I think uh like I, I tweeted out I think this week is my favorite part about that was the fans reactions and that's something I've never really experienced at the J specifically like it's something we've worked for for a while now it's like my freshman year we barely filled the stands and now we had to turn people away at our games hmm. and I think that's a sign to build us a stadium but you know that's just me <laughs> <laughs> hey take the opportunities cameras on you right now mm -hmm. it might as well I, I, I had yeah. that in my notes. You, you said favorite part of this video, and it's a video of when you guys won and, and the crowd goes nuts, is the fans in the background, this place will always hold a special place in my heart. Is it because mm -hmm. of the way that you guys have built this program over the years? Is that why it sticks in you, or is there some other reason? Yeah, I think it's that. Like, just, you know, setting the building blocks and building this program up to what it is and, you know, staying with it and the fact that, like, five of the you know seniors and came back for their fifth year I think that shows a lot um I also think our fans and the community around us is something really really unique and I've been very very thankful to be a part of it and something I've been saying a lot to you know others who ask me about the game is people when they come play here it's not like you're going to a hostile environment you're coming here it's going to be a very intimate experience for the fans because you're so close to the field um, I also think that our fans do a great job of like cheering with us and cheering for us and they don't attack the other team and I think that's something really special that not a lot of people get where they go. You mentioned that was, that was your last game at that place, the yeah. last game in Evanston. Did you yeah. get a moment either during the game or at the end to just kind of 
look around and soak it all in? Yeah, um, right when we won, we always do like the fight song to the fans. And I remember I had to like stop singing and I was definitely getting emotional because I was just kind of looking around in the backstop and just really taking it in and seeing how full it was. And it's, like I said, it's something I've never experienced before at the J. Like it was so, so, so full and so packed and so loud and such a great time. Um, and then after we like talked and did our team picture, like my coaches and I, we got really emotional with each other just because like I poured my heart and soul into this program and it's, I'm even like getting a little emotional now about like being my last game there. Um, but you know, we have practice today, so I'll be out there, <laughs> but yeah. <laughs> um, when, I mean, you mentioned how all these leaders, these, these players like you who are fifth year seniors, who does the talking? Like when you're in that, that seventh inning situation where there's a, a stressful situation, is there one person who's kind of just taken on that job of like, I'm going to say something to everybody? Um, I think it kind of really depends on the situation. And I think that's something special we have is we have a really good feel for each other. And um, like, I, I'm pretty sure we called the timeout like in the seventh when they had the bases loaded. And I can't remember if it was Maeve or I, but it's one of us two normally. We kind of just give each other that look of like, okay, yeah, we need a moment right now. Um, and sometimes it's not even like a, a collective decision. It's like someone just saying, I need a moment right now, so let's come together and you know really breathe. And yeah, I just think it's really special. It's not always one person. Um, and everyone steps up when they need their time and it's like a good understanding we have with each other. One of those fifth year seniors you brought up earlier is Danielle Williams, who's just been this amazing talent. She's the all time leader in wins in program history. She mm -hmm. closed out that last game. When did you first realize as a teammate what you had in her? Honestly, like my freshman year, it had to be, I think Danielle's really, really fun to play behind. And I think that's because she brings such a loose mindset and attitude. Like she really doesn't take it that seriously. And it, it kind of just brings you back to reality. Like this is a game and we're supposed to have fun with each other. And she's a really good reminder of that. And, um, even in stressful moments, like I find myself like, we think about something else, like not softball, like we talk about her puppy that she just got or like yeah. something totally random. And I think it just takes the pressure off all of us. And she's just so like stoic out there and so calm. And it's just um, the way she just interacts with the defense. I think it's really, really special. I mean, all I want to know is this puppy now. What kind, what's the name? Oh, I don't even know. Oh, it's like just got born. <laughs> I think it's like a mini. Ber Bernie or something, Mini Bernadoodle or something. You're just making yeah. up names. <laughs> getting no, confirmation with that one. <laughs> Mini Bernie, that's not a name of a dog. Come on now. <laughs> I don't know. Shelmeyer, if you were prepared to talk about your teammate's dog's name, then apparently you weren't prepared for this interview. Oh, wait, I think it's called Bowser, or the name is Bowser. Okay. I actually don't know, but I think that's right. <laughs> Good save, and let's be honest, am I going to know if you're lying? No, so we move on. No, <laughs> you're not. From, from the experience end of the spectrum to the brand new end of the spectrum. Let me talk about Kansas Robinson. Two homers mm. in the same inning the other day against Kentucky. An amazing day, but why has she had such a breakout year? I can't, you know, like I, there's something about Kansas that is just like really, she's really fun to watch play and play behind. And I really just think that her like breakout year, her freshman year, like why she's doing so well is just how much work she puts in every day at practice. Like I always see her like taking the extra reps and giving the extra swings when she can, or even working um, working on, on defense and trying to, you know, get on the field as well. But she's just really special and she's really stepped up this year, especially when we needed her. And it is really awesome that she hit two home runs in the same inning and didn't even realize it. <laughs> Uh, so that, that inning in, uh, helped propel you guys off to where you are now. You're ready for super regional action. You're ready to head to Alabama. You guys have played in super regionals before. Does it feel different? Like at, at this point, is it whether it's a Big Ten tournament or an NCAA tournament or a College World Series, it all feels the same? Or, or can you feel something different in the air when you're playing in a super regional? You know, I think it is different. Um, and I'm... I'm mainly pulling from my experiences in the past five years. It's like my freshman year we made it to a Super Regional, which was 
something very special to experience at such a young age or part of my career and knowing I think we just have so much confidence in our ability and our experience because we've been there so many times in this group of people we have such an old group of people that know how to do it and I especially think playing at Arizona State last year for Supers was um, a good preparation mark for us going into this weekend like we know how to do it we know how to handle a big crowd that's not going to be very nice <laughs> um, we know how to communicate on the field when it's loud we've played at the biggest stage in the world um, yeah I think I think we're good um, and there's definitely a different feel in the air but nothing that we're overlooking or like nothing we're making too big like it's a game we're gonna go get the job done Job happens to be in Tuscaloosa against Alabama. Before I let you go, finish this sentence. We will win this weekend if... If we hit the ball. Well, yeah, you can't win if you don't <laughs> score a run. I suppose that's... But just keep it simple. All right. Well, that, hey, energy, hit the ball. Makes perfect <laughs> sense. It's working for you guys so far. Skylar, congratulations on the great season. Go get him this weekend. And as always, say hi to Bowser, okay? All right, will do. Go Cats. <laughs> There's the lacrosse team is off to Philadelphia. They beat Army 10 to 9. That means Duke is waiting for them in the semifinal match this Saturday. We're glad to bring in Jeff Tambroni, the head coach of the Nittany Lions. And uh, again, what a great time to have you on, sir, as your team's about to play in the semifinals. Let's go back to that Army game for a second. Um, you start off down 0-2 quickly. But then you score six straight goals. What felt different in those two early chapters of the game? Yeah, I mean, unfortunately, we've gotten off to what I would consider just, just either sluggish or just poor starts in a number of our games. Certainly in the latter half of the season, we were down five to nothing against Johns Hopkins earlier in the year, down seven to one um, in the first round of the playoffs. And, and then against Army, down two, two to nothing in, in the first quarter. But <clears throat> I think I think our guys have done a really nice job of just being re really resilient and just finding ways to just build momentum um, bit by bit in different areas of the field. So there was never any panic. We we did call a timeout and get our guys together um, just to try to reset the their kind of the focus on on the simplicity of the game, the moment itself, and just being back and being present and. I thought our guys did a really nice job, but our, our leadership has been really good in the, in these moments, especially when things seem to be moving in a different direction or, or we're lacking any momentum or confidence, and the guys seem to get it back really quick with, with some of the leaders that we have on our team, and thankfully they did just that against Army. And it stayed a close game. In fact, comes to a one-goal game with a little less than four minutes to go. Lacrosse is such an interesting sport because on the one hand, you can score really quickly, and on the other hand, you could go minutes without scoring at all. So what was that stress like once it became a one goal game, the final few minutes of action? You know, thankfully we've been in a lot of those games. Like last year we were in a lot of those games and unfortunately on the wrong end, we lost uh, I think six one goal games last year. This year we've, we've turned it around, um, been very resilient at the end of games, um, found just, just great fortitude and made some, some big time plays at both ends of the field, offensively and defensively. And, kind of figured it going into this game you're playing against a team from army um and, and they play very symbolic of what you'd expect out of an army team uh, representing that institution and we knew that there was going to be no quit and a lot of fight in that team and uh we, we were bracing and buckled in for a 60 minute contest regardless of, of who was out in front they take a two to nothing lead we take a six to two lead but i think both teams showed a lot of will and grit throughout the course of that game and you know, towards the end of the game, we had, you know, some tough situations, most of them that happened in the defensive end. I was grateful by the way the guys kind of got together and, and, and played really well as a unit. Um, there didn't seem to be any panic in the timeouts or in the huddles that we had later in the game. And we actually even went, went, went man down um, in that last portion of the game, but, but there was never any panic. And uh, they, they showed just uh, great confidence and trust in each other. And we were just grateful that the clock ran out before that last shot went in. <laughs> Yeah, I'm sure you were also grateful that you had Jack Frasion as your goalkeeper. Um, I've heard you in the past refer to him as someone who has a special mindset and special confidence. How so? You know, he's just really consistent. I'd say it starts with just his consistency, his ability to prepare every single day. Um, 
you know, like it's the first day that he's coming out there. It's just he resets regardless of how well he played the day before or how poorly he played the day before. And every day in practice, he has the same routine. Um, he's motivated to be better every day. Um, he, he's very intense in his own self-development, which I love. I think all the elite players, certainly student athletes at any level, um, are just in tune to how to develop your game. And, and uh, each and every day, he tries to do just that. So I think it starts there, um, his ability to turn the page. Um, and be a really confident leader when you're looking back in there, whether whether or not uh, you know things are going really well or, like I said, things are going poorly. I think our guys look to him as a sounding board because he's just really poised throughout the course of the game. So, you know, as just a young man, he's just a sophomore, and uh, he played quite a bit for us as a freshman. But this year, he took over that that leadership role and has never looked back. And you know, he's he's a special young man because not just because he's a, a, a talented stopper and goaltender, but he's becoming a leader and a source of confidence for everybody on our team, not just the defense for it, but but for everybody on our team. So we're we're grateful to have him and he's done a really good job of just keeping us in games or even winning some games for us. Another leader on your squad, TJ Malone, you've talked in the past about what stands out with him is how much he loves lacrosse. How do you see that manifest itself? Yeah, I think that's, you know, when he came in, you could just tell he was just, he was a kid of sorts, um, a young man coming into to college, but a kid of sorts in terms of his passion for the game. Um, you know, he's the kind of guy that sticks around after practice quite a bit, and uh, I think it's rare that he'll just leave the practice field um, before most, if anybody. He's like the last guy on that practice field just working on his own game or just working on certain things with other guys on the, on the team. Um, he gets up every morning, does a little bit of extra work, which I think says a lot about him, his, uh, his, his pride in his own development, but I also think the love for the game. So TJ's been you know, a beacon of, of inspiration for, for the rest of our team because of the injuries that he went through and how he's recovered. But again, also because of the passion for the way he plays the game. We say this to our recruits and our team, like if, if this feels like a job, if you feel like when you're playing college sports, it's a job, you got to go to practice or you got to go out and do extra work, you're, you're probably in the wrong um, in the wrong or arena or wrong culture. For, for TJ, it's a, it's a get to. I get to come to practice today, I get to do a little bit of extra work with my teammates or stick around on the field. And I think that that attitude has been really contagious to the rest of the guys. And he, he loves just not just the spotlight or not just game day. He loves the game of lacrosse and everything that comes with it. And I think that uh, we've been a, been a benefactor for all of that love and that passion. And, and thankfully, it's starting to rub off on the rest of the guys in the team. Before we let you go, Coach, number one, Duke is up next. What's going to be the biggest key in facing them? Mindset is probably the biggest thing. I mean, they're just tremendously talented. They're, they're number one in the country, the number one seed for a reason. They're just really balanced. Um, probably three of the best offensive players, period, in the country, all playing for the same attack line. Really good at the faceoff X, really good defensively. There's really not a weakness on the team. So I think it's important to go over there and to make sure that we remain confident, continue to do what we have done to get us into this position. Just recognize that we're here for a reason. You know, we've won big games before, and when you play under the lights in an atmosphere like this, this is the biggest stage, the greatest stage in, in all of lacrosse, not just college lacrosse, but all of lacrosse. It's important just to um, keep your, your, your boots on the ground, remain humble, and just kind of go out and do what you think you can do um, and or what, you, what you've done all year to get you in this point and not get away from that game plan. So ho hopefully we'll have a positive and really confident mindset, but at the same time just focus on simplicity when we go in there and just, just have some fun with the moment. Jeff Tambroni, one of four coaches left standing. Good luck Saturday against Duke. We appreciate your time. Great. Thanks so much. And the one-two. Is drilled in the air to left field. Tito Flores pushed back to the warning track. Wall, that's a grand slam! Braden Frazier unloads the bases. The ninth grand slam of the year for the Hawkeyes. That was the key in the victory for Iowa in the first game of the Big Ten tournament. And now it gives the Hawkeyes 40 wins on the season. That means only two years in program history have they had more victories than they have right now.
The guy who hit that slam, Braden Frazier, is good enough to join us now for our big interview. And he's joining us from Omaha as the Big Ten tournament rolls on. Uh, Braden, my favorite part about that clip is the announcer saying the count. You had two strikes on you for that salami. What do you remember thinking right before that pitch was thrown? Well, I know that we do a, a good amount of scouting um, before the games, and we knew that O'Halloran was a really good pitcher and that he liked to go to his slider with two strikes. And um, my scouting report for myself is that I'm probably going to chase that more often than not. And I got one over the middle of the plate with two strikes and put a good swing on it. Listen, I'm not going to pretend I haven't hit a grand slam before because obviously I've hit thousands. But what does it feel like? Oh, man, it's a pretty good feeling. Honestly, that was my first one, too. Um, so I'm kind of going through all the emotions through that. Um, but it was it was probably up there in my baseball moments in my career for sure. First one in your career, even all the way back to Little League? Yep, yep. As far as I can remember, that's my first one. Okay, so where are you looking as you round the bases? Are you looking at your teammates? Or you're just sort of like, I got to make sure I step on these four white boxes here. Uh, I was looking directly at my teammates, man. There's no better feeling than looking in the dugout and knowing I just did something big for them because they've been having my back all year. Um, we've had a great year this far, um, and we're just trying to keep it going. Well, th the thing is, you're, it might be your first slam, but it's certainly not the team's. Nine grand slams this season for the squad. That's a lot, man. Yeah, I, I, when they told me that yesterday, I honestly didn't know that we'd hit that many. Um, it doesn't seem like it, but uh, we've been generous enough and fortunate enough that we've been hitting pretty well, and we've gotten guys in that situation, and the right guys have stepped up at the right time. So your team now has 19 different times that, they've, that you guys have scored double-digit runs in a game. And in all 19 of those games, your record is 19-0. and 0. What is the key to when your offense really gets in a groove? I think the key is that we just have the balance up and down the lineup, man. It doesn't matter who's in or who's out for that game. Um, we're going to have hitters up and down the lineup, one through nine, that can really do their job. And something that we've really prided ourselves on this year is that when we go into a game, we know that um, that person is going to do their job and pass the baton to the next guy. We call it doing our one ninth. So that person, when he steps into the box, is going to do his job. And if he doesn't do his job, the next person behind him is going to do that job. Doing your one ninth. Who came up with that? That's one of our coaches, probably Marty Sutherland. He's the one that enforces that every day with us, that we're just going to do our one ninth when we step into that box. Doesn't matter who's pitching. Doesn't matter who's hitting. I like that. It's like when a pitcher just worries about getting the three outs in the inning, doesn't worry about anything yep. big picture. You break down baseball to small increments. It's, yep. it's a great way for success. Speaking of success, let's turn over to the pitching side of your team. You got Jack Whitlock entering the game in not a great spot. Runners on second and third. Then he walks a guy and proceeds to go strike out, strike out, strike out. What kind of a roller coaster was it watching that happen? Oh man, it was it was kind of a roller coaster watching that from the outfield. But I'm not gonna lie, Jack Whitlock, Jack Whitlock has done that for us all year, man. He uh, started out not even traveling for us at the beginning of the year, and he's just kept his head down, has been grinding all year. Um, what a great guy, too. I mean, he's the most humble, um, awesome person uh, to be around, and I can't be more happy for him that he was in that moment, and I knew he was gonna step up. Well, how's he done it? What's been his key to success this year? He's just been grinding, man. I mean, that guy puts in the work every single day. He's with our coaches every single day. Um, just putting in the work, keeping his head down, being quiet about it, um, and just being that trusted leader that we know every time that we're going to go to him, uh, he's going to get the job done for us. So he comes on, bases loaded, and goes strikeout, 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 and heads to the dugout. Compare for me dugout celebrations after what he did versus after your slam. Oh, it was probably the same. I'm going to be honest. I was kind of running in from the outfield, didn't know exactly what was going on when he struck him out. But um, I know our pitchers are just as fired up for a guy that goes into that situation and gets the job done as our hitters are for when I go into that situation and get my job done. So I mentioned earlier you guys have 40 wins now. And you talked about offensively you guys just try to increment it, just doing one-ninth of your responsibility. Give me something that people don't see as to why your team succeeds this season. Something that people probably don't see is all the little things that we train on. So something that we train on a lot is our vision. Um, we train every single day on uh, the little things as far as depth perception and how to react and our reaction time and everything like that. Um, so when we go into the box or we go into a game, we know that we are going to be at our best 100% no matter what. And I assume a lot of that stems from the head coach, Rick Heller, who's been around the block a time or two. Tell me something I don't know about him. 
something you probably don't know about Rick. Oh, geez. Um, I'd say that he's he's just a really good guy, um, and that when he breaks out his guitar, I've never personally seen it, but I've heard a lot of stories that he can really shred on the guitar. Whoa, 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 whoa. He, how do you know this if you haven't seen it? Uh, I've just heard the stories, man. He's never he's never been uh, never been that guy to want to bring it out at practice or in the locker room or anything like that. But I've heard a lot of stories that that guy can shred on the guitar. Okay, I'm already disappointed in you. You know he can shred on the guitar and you haven't forced him to pull it out? No, I haven't. I haven't. Maybe that'll be one of my, my going away gifts. No, this is, this is what you do. You say to him today, Coach, when we win the Big Ten tournament, you're pulling that out in the postgame celebration. Put it all on his shoulders. Yep, I, I should do that, shouldn't I? Yes, I, I'm waiting for you. I'd like you to film it as you do it, too, and put it online, okay? I will. I will. Uh, hey, what do you guys think, by the way, about the new format to the Big Ten tournament this year? Last year, obviously, the games were more clumped together. Some bad weather meant we were in a real bind and games were starting at midnight. How do you guys as players feel about the shift this year where it's more days, less games, more ability to skip out on some of the drama we had last year? Uh, yeah, man, it's much better. I mean, especially for us, we kind of got fortunate. We got that morning game. And that's kind of a blessing for us because now we can go into that day, basically have the rest of that day off. And then we got this next day off as well because we won. Um, and so that just gives us plenty more rest, plenty more bullpen rest, especially, which is what we need in these long tournament situations like this. Um, but we're all looking back on it last year. We were playing, we played about three or four 9 a.m. games. And then there were teams that played 10, 10 p.m. games and they were, they were finishing up after midnight. Oh, man, it was just kind of a mess. But uh, this year, it's been a lot better for us so far. Yeah, it seems like a smart shift. And, and you mentioned the fact that you guys now get a day off. Not only do you get to rest, you get to grow that caterpillar on your lip. Please tell me that is going to be here for a while. Oh, it's going to be here to stay, man. I, like I was telling you before, it's kind of gone in and out. Um, but it's definitely here to stay for sure. What's the best you've ever grown mustache-wise? Oh, probably what you're looking at right now. This has been, this has been a few weeks maybe two months in the process right here. All right, well, I'm proud of it. Before I let you go, although I'd like to ask many more things about facial hair, let's focus on your <laughs> next game. You got Indiana, a matchup of two of the top three seeds in the conference. What are your early thoughts? Well, my thoughts are that they're, they're a great team, man. They can really swing it, they can really pitch it. Uh, we know that we're gonna go into this and expect a dogfight here, um, but we know that we're, we're confident in ourselves and that we can get the job done as well. You know what would help your team is if you had another Grand Slam, so might as well just do that. Might as well. Hey, if I'm in that situation, I'm going to do my best. Back-to-back -back games with slams. Why not? First two times of your life. I expect it now, Braden. Braden Frazier, congratulations on the win. Thanks so much for giving us some of your time. Thank you. I appreciate it. Go Hawks.